Good morning and welcome to this service of worship at Bethel Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. This morning we're in the third week of the season of Lent that prepares us for the passion of Christ and then uh, Easter morning and his resurrection. So let's start this time of worship off singing together that great hymn of the faith, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. That was great. Now, uh, we have this opportunity to come before the Lord and to bring those needs that are on our hearts, both our joys and those things that we're struggling with. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, the day that you have, rema- have made, and I pray that we would rejoice in this day. Open our eyes and our hearts to all that you have for us. And we come, uh, Lord, entering your throne room to crawl up on your lap and share with those those things that are on our hearts. And so, Lord, we lift up those who are uh, struggling with this coronavirus. We thank you for your presence and we pray for your healing touch in their lives. We thank you for those who have worked hard on getting this vaccine out and those who are serving this community by uh, being a part of getting those vaccines into the arms of people. And Lord, we pray for those who, uh, because of this virus, are, are still uh, feeling lonely and separated and isolated. We pray that they would know your presence and your power. We pray they would know that you are sovereign and in control, even at a time like this. And uh, Father, we thank you for first responders, and we pray for all of those, Lord, who, uh, who are caring for their neighbors. And we pray for your church, as we prayed last week and uh, talked about last week, that we would be one in you and work together to love and serve this community and the world that we live in. We pray for those on the mission field, bringing the gospel to all parts of the world. And Lord, we ask that you would give us an excitement 
to share the good news of Jesus Christ with somebody uh, who needs to hear that this week. We come and we pray these things in the name and the way that you taught your disciples to pray by praying our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now because it is the... uh, the first Sunday of the month, a communion Sunday here at, uh, at the Bethel Church. We uh, normally say the Apostles' Creed, but on communion Sundays, we go back to the year 325 to where the church has declared uh, universally what it is that we believe. And so I would invite you to uh, join with me in saying this creed. And uh, it will, the words will be on the screen. So what is it that we believe? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now with that in mind, we would invite you to uh, grab the kids that are uh, around the room and set them before the television or the computer because we have a very special message just for them from our director of family and children's ministry, Ryan Potter. Hello, everyone. This week, we are jumping into a new series called Bake Off where we get to learn about patience and trusting in God. And this week, we learn that God is with us even while we wait. We get to read about a man named Simeon in the Bible. And Simeon had been waiting his entire life, a very, very long time, for God to fulfill his promise of sending a Savior. I can only imagine the amount of patience that that required. Now, for us, patience might look something like waiting until you finish your dinner to get a brownie for dessert, or waiting for the brownies to cool off before you can cut them and eat them or even waiting for the brownies to be baked in the oven while the rest of your house starts to smell like yummy, yummy chocolate brownies. Now, don't you wish that you could snap your fingers and brownies could appear? Unfortunately, that isn't the case. But here's the thing. If you just wait, I promise you it will be worth the wait. Now back to Simeon, one day the Holy Spirit came to him and told him to go to the temple. He had no idea why he was being asked to go to the temple, but he loved and trusted God, so he obeyed him and went. And do you know who he saw there? Jesus. This just so happened to be the same day that Mary and Joseph were bringing baby Jesus to the temple. So, because of Simeon's patience, he not only got to hear about baby Jesus, he got to see baby Jesus, and even better, he got to meet baby Jesus. So, Simeon's patience wasn't easy, but we do know that God was with him every step of the way. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for who you are. 
Thank you for the ways that you love us and you show us all of the good things that you have in store for our lives. Lord, let us be patient. Let us wait for these good things because we know what you promise is good. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. It is so good of you to uh, join us for this very special time of worship uh, during our Lenten season. We are focusing together on the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. And uh, we've kind of made a commitment as a church that as we experience the intimacy that Jesus had with his father in this prayer, that we want to experience that kind of intimacy with God during this season of Lent. And so we took the fact that it's the year 2021 and we were committed to uh, spending 20 minutes a day to be one with him. 20 to one. 20 minutes a day to be one with him in this intimate relationship. And we have this this. Uh, uh, path that we're taking. We uh, have cards that are out, and uh, but as you see on the screen, what we're doing is we're we're going to take time to praise Him, and then ask Him for those things uh, on our hearts and those needs that we see in the world. We're going to thank Him for the fact that He is bigger than anything that we face, and that. Uh, uh, we can turn these things over to him and then we're going to honor him by doing a kingdom thing, a kingdom act of kindness uh, each day. It's kind of our, our, our Lenten focus. And we invite you to join a small group if you're not in one as we really unpack this very special uh, holy moment between Jesus and his heavenly father. Now, because we are in the season of Lent, we have a Lenten offering. And so there are two places that we're focusing uh, our resources, and that is NEMAP. And we're providing uh, financial support, but also items. And uh, you can call the church to see how, what those are. And also, we're supporting the, the Love One Another ministry, which is a ministry, a tangible ministry to the homeless in our community. And they have very tangible, specific needs, as well as um, uh, financial needs where we can buy and purchase some of those things that are on their wish list and their need list. They have been very cold this winter. And lately they have been very wet as uh, the snow has melted. And so uh, we want to do all that we can to love and support and care for those who have these tremendous needs. Now, I also want to remind you of uh, uh, next Tuesday, this coming Tuesday at 6 o'clock at the church or 6 o'clock online, we'd love to invite you to come to our discovery class. And that's where you find out more about what it means to be a covenant partner. We're not just members of a church together, but we're in this together. We covenant with each other and we're partners in ministry. And so coming to that doesn't make you a covenant partner, but it informs you as to what is happening here at uh, Bethel Presbyterian Church. And so you're invited to be part of that. Also, we want to uh, uh, thank you once again for your generous support of the ministries here at Bethel. And as always, there are four ways that you can bless this church to the giving of your tithes and offerings. And that is, you can go to our website, BethelAtReed.com. And there's a place to to uh, click on Easy Tithe, where you can uh, uh, give to the church uh, through that medium. Or you can go online with your local bank, and there are ways to send resources through your local bank to the church. You can also send in tithes and offerings through the United States Postal Service, or you can even stop by because the office is open every day from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. But you have not come uh, for announcements. You have come to um, 
to learn uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus as we open his word. And so let us head there right now. Jesus had a question for his disciples, and uh, I have one for you today. When you think of Jesus, how do you picture him? What, what, what picture comes to mind? When you think of Jesus, um, do you think of a shepherd? Or a teacher? When you think of Jesus and picture him, do you think of Jesus being a man of sorrows, just carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Do you picture him being friendly with everyone, especially children and primarily for children? Do you picture him being stern, maybe a little finger wagging your way? Do you see him as laughing? Or do you see him as kind of uh, my buddy Jesus? If you were to picture him, how would you picture him? I was talking to a number of folks this week, and, and the thought for many is they see him as the shepherd, the good shepherd. They, they also, a number, see him as the rabbi. Those in our, our college and younger adult arena said, well, many, many college folks that they know really see Jesus more as the stern Jesus. Now, here might be a surprise for you. How do you think Jesus really was and wanted to be seen as. Before we talk about that, let's talk to him. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we might see Jesus clearly. And Holy Spirit, as we wander into this holy of holies, this prayer, in John chapter 17, you are the one that takes words that are written on a page and takes them and writes them on our hearts and helps us to become more like Jesus. I pray that you would do this, this moment. And if there would be anything that would hinder us hearing you, I pray that you would remove it. For we've come to see Jesus and to be changed by him into his likeness. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, as I said, we're on holy ground because we're invited into the most holiest of moments where Jesus, the night he was betrayed, from the, uh, somewhere between the upper room and his arrest in the garden, he stops and he prays to his heavenly father in such a way that the disciples hear it. And this is a, indeed a holy moment because you have God talking to God. And we learn that Jesus had a task of glorifying the father. But he had another task of educating and uh, showing the father to his group of disciples. And he said, I have done that. And he asked the father in his prayer, there's four things that he prays for these disciples. The first is that they would be one. They would be in this together. And you might be surprised at what he prays next. He prays this. But now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus' prayer is that the disciples 
would have the joy of Jesus in them. Look at the text. Now, when you think of Jesus, do you think of his joyfulness? Well, I'm not sure that we get that when we look at a stained glass Jesus or a picture of Jesus that we get his joy. Now, notice he prays for them, not that they would have joy, any kind of joy, but that they would have a specific joy, that they would have the joy of Jesus. He is asking that the very joy that is in him might be in, poured into their souls, into them. Now, do you know that it was so important for Jesus to pass on his joy that actually the night of, of his arrest uh, in the upper room and then later on the way to the garden, he talks twice about his joy and his desire for them. In John chapter 15, now we know he enters the upper room and uh, has a meal with them starting in John 13. So this is part of this last night's dinner. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And then second, in this high priestly prayer in John 17 on his way to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and his arrest, he says, but now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, if you think about it, you and I probably would have said, no, Jesus would have prayed that his love would be in them. Or his peace would be in them. But no, he prays that they would have his joy. Not a joy like his, but the very joy that was inside of him would be in them. Now, if that is true, where did this joy come from? What's the cause of this deep joy? And we find out in the book uh, written, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament makes a very interesting statement about this joy that Jesus has. It's found in the book of Hebrews <laughs> chapter 1 verse 9. And it's about Jesus. And the author writes, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. It says that Jesus was anointed with an oil of gladness. Different than anybody else and everybody else. He was anointed with this oil. Do you know what the word gladness means? It literally means to jump, to leap. Now, that makes all kind of sense because when you have deep joy, you just, it, it, it lifts you airborne. You leap for joy. It's a sign of deep joy. Now, uh, it's interesting where else this uh, Greek word is used. Do you remember uh, before the birth of Christ, uh, Mary's cousin Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. And when Mary found out that she was pregnant, she went to see her cousin Elizabeth. And look what happens when Mary, who is carrying Jesus, meets Elizabeth, who's carrying John, John the Baptist, yet to be born. It says this in Luke 1, verse 43. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. 
The same word is this gladness that Jesus has is found in the pre-born embryo child that Elizabeth carried. This joy is contagious. His joy is so full, so exuberant, that uh, it's amazing that we in the church, we, we kind of, our picture of Jesus sometime is a, a, a pale, holier-than-thou kind of outsider to everything that's happening in the world. But the scriptures tell us that he was a man of joy. There was a skip in his step. Even his human arrival brought good news of great joy. Remember the Christmas passage from Luke 2. And the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So what, what is it that elicits this joy? Well, Jesus comes from a place that's full of joy. And we find it in many of his parables. For instance, in Matthew 13, when Jesus is giving an illustration of what the kingdom of God is like, he says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. He discovers this treasure of the kingdom of heaven and he skips to sell all that he has to buy that field. And Jesus, again, portrays the joy of the Father, portrays his joy in the three parables that are found in Luke chapter 15. The first joy that we find now is in the, the shepherd that has a sheep that is lost. You know the story, but here it is, Luke 15. And when he found it, the shepherd found this lost sheep, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And just so, Jesus goes on. I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. But if they didn't get it in that story, they're to get it in the next one where the, Jesus tells the story of the woman who lost her coin. We see his joy again in Luke 15 verse 9. And when she found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then we find the joy of the father as the lost son comes home. Jesus' joy is found in finding lost things. And we discover that as Jesus sends out the 72 to go and he, he unleashes them for ministry and they come back rejoicing. Look what they say. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. He's saying, I, I saw it. It was amazing, incredible things were happening in your ministries. But verse 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice in the relationship you have 
by faith with your heavenly Father. Rejoice that you were lost and now you are found, you are home. That's where your rejoicing should be. You see, Jesus' joy was in his relationship with the Father and his invitation to invite others into that relationship and the joy he had in making that happen. In fact, he turned to his disciples. He goes on and says privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you and did see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Many have longed for this to happen. Fallen, broken people people restored to a relationship with their heavenly father. That's what brought Jesus joy. And it always brought Jesus joy, even in his darkest moments, even in those moments of his suffering and difficulties. How do we know that? Because the scriptures tell us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, the writer writes, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. Jesus endured the most difficult of circumstances, being tried as a criminal, being crucified, painfully dying on the cross. And in the midst of all that pain and loneliness and suffering, he had joy. The joy set before him that through these actions, you and I would come into a saving relationship with our heavenly father through his death on the cross. And the apostle Paul do you know what he says his joy is going to be in heaven? Seeing all of those who he shared the gospel with in heaven with him. They will be his joy and his crown. Jesus and Paul were on the same page. Joy comes from taking broken, sinful people and bringing them into a Eternal life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what brought Jesus joy. That is what Jesus wants us to know and to experience. And Jesus said, joy is going to last forever in heaven. Right now, you're going to face difficulties but in those difficulties, you can have joy because those difficulties don't have the last word. Look what he says in John 16, that night that, uh, that he was betrayed. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again because of the cross. I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will ever take that joy from you. That is an eternal promise. That is the taste of heaven that we can experience now, not only in our relationship with our Heavenly Father through the cross, but our joy in bringing others into that relationship with the Father in heaven. All right, it's time for a reality check. What if I came in? told you, you have just won $2 million through the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. I knock on your door. I've got this big check of $2 million, and it is yours. Wow. That would be incredible. Now, what if I came to you and said, Wow, you have just shared your faith with someone who did not know our Heavenly Father. And they bent their knee in faith in a relationship to begin a relationship with him through Jesus Christ that you initiated. 
You brought this person into the kingdom of God. What would your reaction be? Which brings a greater sense of joy? A $2 million sweepstakes winner? Or a life eternally changed through the good news of Jesus Christ? Why would you or I settle for what's not even second best or third best? Why would we settle for a temporary thrill when we can be part of an eternal difference. In Jesus' mind and in his prayer, he wanted the disciples to know the joy, the eternal joy of introducing people to his heavenly father because of his death on the cross. And that their joy would be full because of that. I pray that we would know this joy that's eternal and treasure that over this joy that is temporary and fraught with problems. Now let me tell you, about those pictures in the beginning that I showed you of the different ways that people see Jesus. I want to bring one back to your attention. It was created in 1973 uh, by a Canadian. It was a pencil drawing. It was a pencil drawing of Jesus laughing. Well, that artist died, and uh, it was a Canadian church that uh, received the rights to that and sold the rights to a, a Christian group in San Francisco and they reproduced it. And one day, uh, uh, a gentleman who uh, did computer graphics and uh, saw the picture and he asked if he could take the picture and colorize it and it's the picture that has become famous of Jesus Laughing, and and this happened because this um, uh, this person had an encounter with Jesus Christ and wanted the world to know. But I tell you that story because the amazing thing is that the original picture of pencil drawing of Jesus laughing was not titled Jesus laughing, but was titled Jesus the Liberator. I love that. That's what he came to do. That's what brought him joy. He liberates folks from their sin to an eternal relationship with his heavenly father. And it causes him to laugh and to leap and brings great joy. And that's his prayer that we, you and I, would know that and would experience that. Now, just yesterday... I was working on this message and not sure how to tie it up, how, how to kind of put an ending uh, uh, to it. And um, there was basically a knock on my office door and there was a father and he had his second grade daughter with him. And, and he said, do you have a moment? And, and uh, I said, sure. And he said, my daughter wrote a letter to this church. You see, we watch you on Sunday mornings. And Phoebe, as you're watching, you were such and are such a blessing. And we want to follow up. But she came in and handed me this letter. And let me read it to you. Um, as she read it to me. Dear church, my name is Phoebe. You have been helping people learn about God and to be a Christian. I want to say thank you. Church is kind of like where God lives. 
So I wanted to send this note because I wanted to know if you could help me spread the word of God. Thank you. Your friend, Phoebe. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. What a blessing. Phoebe knows that joy that many of us have forgotten or put away or allowed other things to get in the way. So my prayer is that the prayer of Jesus would be answered, that we wouldn't know our joy or joy like his, but that you and I would ask the Father that we would have his joy and know what it's like to make an eternal difference in the life of someone who does not know him. You think about that. Amen. Pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the amazing ways that you open our eyes to the truth of your word, the eternal truth. And I thank you that it comes through little second graders who get it. Oh, Lord, may we not know just know joy or just not know joy like yours, but that we would know your joy and be filled so help us tell others about the kingdom. And if there's anyone here listening to this who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would know your joy and that one day there would be joy in heaven that because of this church, people would come to know Jesus Christ in a saving way. Oh, Lord, we want that. And not only know this church, but each of us, as we communicate, rekindle in us the joy of our salvation that it might overflow into the lives of those all around us. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples in the upper room and he washed their feet. He served them as he was going to serve them by giving his life on the cross that they might be restored to that relationship. And there is a meal for you today, a meal of joy that reminds us of what it cost for us to be restored to that relationship. I would invite you to go pick up the elements. You just need a simple loaf of bread. And I hope that you do this in your family, looking at each other and reminding each other of the words. On the night he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread that really represented his body. And he, he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. When you do this, remember me. The idea in Hebrew of remembrance is to put your pl yourself at that place. You're invited to the table. You're invited to the foot of the cross. And because of faith, you'll be invited to the banquet in heaven. When you do this, do it in memory of me. And then at the same meal, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Drink this. And when you drink it, drink it in memory of me. The reminder of what it cost us to be in that eternal relationship is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, sins cannot be forgiven. And now, if you would just take a moment, 
with the juice that you have and the bread that you have, if you would share that with each other, reminding them that the blood of Christ was shed and the body of Christ broken for the forgiveness of all of their sins. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, in this simple meal, there is so much. And in the brokenness of the bread and in the pouring out of the cup, reminding us of your shed blood, you did that joyfully because we would be one with you. May these elements, as we ingest them, May it bring that joy of our salvation, the reminder that we're worth dying for. May it well up inside of us and out into the world. And may we know the joy of bringing others into the kingdom of God. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now as we, uh, before the benediction, Let's take a moment and lift our hearts in praise to him. That was great. As we leave this place, may there be a leap in your walk. May the joy of your salvation well up inside of you that you would share the good news with others. May it just overflow. And may you watch God make an eternal difference in the lives of those around you that is absolutely priceless. Go in peace to love serve and leap for him. Amen.